Welcome to the Furniture History Society podcast. My name is Elliot Sterling. And I am Catherine Hardwick. We are both coordinators for the Early Career Development Programme. In this series, we will be talking to an international group of emerging scholars who will be discussing their recent discoveries around the theme of furniture, its design and materiality. Each episode will focus on an individual piece of furniture from 16th century Italy to Amsterdam in the 1930s. From the late 18th century, Prussia sought to build up its cast iron industry and by the 1820s was producing a wide range of objects, from columns and railings to small-scale ornaments. Royal architect Schinkel was particularly interested in the material and in about 1825 he produced his first designs for cast iron garden furniture for the gardens of the Prussian royal palaces. This chair we will be talking about today is based on a design of about 1835 for a garden pavilion known as the Roman Baths in the gardens at Potsdam. The design was produced for about 30 years by foundries all over Europe, with slight variations in the detail of the back, arms and feet. Serena Newmark will be our second speaker of today's podcast series, produced by myself, Vicky Jenner, in celebration of our Early Career Symposium. Episode 2 will thus discuss the materiality of this cast iron garden chair, with the support of Serena, a PhD student in art history in Berlin, who is currently working on the Prussian design diaspora of the 19th century. Hello, Serena. It's so lovely to have you on today. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast episode. I just wanted to ask why you have particularly chosen this object. Well, it's just it's just one of the most beautiful chairs, I think, just in the history of furniture. And it's so important as well because it's considered the first iconic example of industrial furniture production and being made in cast pieces of iron it could be reproduced ad infinitum um, and it was made in pieces to be put together uh, and it has been essentially since it was originally created um, and i just i find that fantastic so let's start then with how does this object feel how how is it to to touch how is it to look could you give a bit of a description serena okay so this is a cast iron armchair and it's sort of generally considered one of the first sort of in the first iconic industrial chair design because it was made to a mold um, originally in the prussian royal ironworks and um, the Prussians had access in their territories to iron ore. They also had access to very fine sand, which is crucial for making a a very highly detailed um, iron casting. So they had sort of the local geography was in their favor in terms of making a cast iron piece of furniture. There had been wrought iron furniture. You know, the ancient Romans had wrought iron furniture. The Middle Ages, there was wrought iron furniture. Um, but the Prussians in the 19th century really take it as a decorative medium, although it's an inexpensive metal. So it's not gold or silver or, you know, a chair made of, you know, imported mahogany from Cuba. It's an inexpensive material coupled with really excellent design. We see a lot of neoclassicism and we see a lot of the Prussian take on neoclassicism, which is pared down, um, not much in the way of color. We see a lot of proportion. Uh, we see curves, counterclockwise curves and, and clockwise curves. And we see a very um, careful use of proportion. And the negative space is as important as the positive space in Prussian design at this period. So to touch this object, um, which was originally intended as a garden piece of furniture, and you know, previously in you know great European gardens, we see um, benches built, you know, made of marble or other stone, um, brick, things that can't be moved. But this was a garden chair that could be moved around. So it's light; it's relatively easy to move around, um, and it 
it's cold, um, so often we see a fabric cushion put on it, um, but not always. The One of the things to keep in mind about these chairs is that they were, even the ones that are created uh, in recent years, are typically made to the original specifications, which were for early 19th century European bodies, which are much smaller than typical chairs today. And so I'm, I'm a woman who's five feet tall, I'm quite petite, and I fit very comfortably in one of these chairs. They're just fantastic for me, um, but a, a large um, two meters tall, six foot tall man um, would have a little more trouble in one of these chairs. I think it's really amazing how this object is so malleable. And as you were touching mm -hmm. on before it, it has this ability to be repurposed in so many different guises and for so many mm -hmm. different locations and people. So do you think that the iron and also this simplified but very minimalist, beautiful design mm -hmm. was created with this in mind? So that's a very interesting question. It was originally made by the king's very favorite architect, King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia, by his royal architect, Karl Friedrich Schinkel, um, for the, the, the Prussian you know, um, palace gardens in Potsdam, in the original, what was called the Roman baths. And Schinkel had made other um, iron furniture for other royal gardens um, that, but this, was, this is the one that keeps getting reproduced. This was the most commercially successful. Um, to what extent it was intended as something that could be made for the masses, that I couldn't say. But I would notice, and this is, this is a large focus of my work, is that Prussian um, craftsmen did continue to create sort of these local versions of this Prussian Berlin high style design. So what we find in ironwork, but also in decorative painting and in wood furniture, we see Prussian craftsmen who left Berlin, you know, who studied under the master from the master's books that he's written, you know, learned these Prussian royal high styles, and then they emigrate. Um, well, they either leave, live in other parts of German-speaking Central Europe, uh, or they emigrate, you know, to South Australia or to Brazil, to South Africa, to the United States, the American Midwest, the American Southwest, and they continue to make objects in with excellent Prussian design um, and with excellent Prussian craftsmanship, but in local materials. So we do find around the world uh, in the Prussian diaspora that this continues to be made at a different, a many different price points um, and for sort of large groups of people that are in many cases very close, if not practically exact copies of things originally designed for the Prussian royal family. That's fantastic, thank you. And I just want to touch on what you mentioned before, how the iron jewellery given to Prussian mm -hmm. civilians in exchange for donating gold jewellery to the war effort to defeat mm -hmm. Napoleon, how that mm -hmm. impacted and has become very much embedded within the history of this object. Could you expand a bit more on that? Oh, certainly. So um, Prussia was occupied by Napoleon's forces for a number of years. And so to wage war against Napoleon, um, Prussian civilians were encouraged to turn in their gold jewelry, you know, a gold ring, um, a gold brooch, a necklace, that sort of thing, to the war effort. And in exchange, they'd get sort of an iron piece of jewelry that was a receipt. It was often a pin. Um, or a brooch occasionally, um, usually of a relatively simple object, often with a female neoclassicist figure saying, Gold gab ich für Eisen. Um, sometimes it's along the Eisen site, um, so I'm giving my gold for iron or a new iron age. Um, but it was, it was I, you know, you give up your wedding ring uh, to serve, you better serve your husband, you know, um, fighting Napoleon's forces, and you would get an iron ring in return. And um, so it, it's very much imbued with this concept of an iron will um, of Prussian patriotism in the war against Napoleon. And, um, and this is also at the time where the, the Iron Cross, the military, the famous German military decoration was designed um, with the, the Prussian king uh, together with Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the architect and the sort of the unquestioned master designer of uh, the Royal Prussian uh, aesthetic. Um, 
created sort of this from the the Teutonic cross the German knights in the Middle Ages wore you know on the Crusades which is a black cross on a white background um, they come up with the iron cross uh, the very iconic iron cross which um, yeah had is the is the German military decoration we know and and um, is today in an altered form um, still used by the, the German Bundeswehr today. Um, as well, after 1815, we have the neoclassical designs of earlier Berlin mm -hmm. ironwork being replaced by Gothic motifs, such as the trefoil and quatrefoil and, and the fine pointed mm -hmm. arches. So um, it, it's really amazing how there's this life cycle with this jewellery. It wasn't just um, a trend. It, it sort of mm -hmm. it very much evolved and continued. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Schinkel is mostly known for his neoclassicism. And we, we think of Athens on the River Spree when we think of um, the first half of the 19th century in Prussia. But absolutely the Gothic trend. I mean, this is, is a northern European country and obviously the Gothic trend and sort of we're all was, was absolutely present. And we're also sort of moving in to the period um, where the, the German speaking Central Europe was fascinated with the Middle Ages. We see, you know, the building of these large you know, castles like Neuschwanstein in the 19th century is the one we know the most. Um, but yeah, this is fondness also for the German Middle Ages alongside and a bit later than the, the neoclassicism. But what's really fascinating um, about the iron jewelry, and, and these are things that still fetch very high prices today at antique stores, you know, thousands of, of euros, dollars, pounds, currency of your choice. Um, and they... Um, there was iron jewelry prior to this, you know, this Prussian high design Prussian jewelry, but it was it was it was costume jewelry and and iron jewelry probably would have been, you know, kind of forgotten about with this, you know, this 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 brief period of costume jewelry, things that are fashionable briefly and then thrown away, um, except that the Prussians really turned iron jewelry into an art form. Um, and it's unusual to see, you know, bracelets and necklaces and brooches and these things out of a, essentially a, a material that has little melt value, um, still fetching such high prices today. Absolutely. And, and treasured in museums as well. Absolutely, yes, yes. And I, I find that relationship between jewellery and furniture and going back and harking back to uh, the armchair that you have chosen, which is mm. actually now an original in the v &A Museum, uh, which is fantastic. We also see, you know, something that was designed specifically to be made in cast iron. Um, so there are different parts that are put together. Um, so of course, the material of the object is going to affect the design. You could not make this chair out of wood. Um, it simply, you know, it would not be possible to have this level of intricate designs. Um, so they could also be, you know, because the pieces were sort of modular, you could, there were also benches that were sort of, um, a number of chairs put together. Schinkel made um, in the Royal um, Prussian Ironworks made a lot of benches, especially early on. Such a perfect location for this incredible object, the fact that it's set within this very romantic ensemble of the Roman baths in this very picturesque, beautiful setting, um, of which is actually a part of a very severe Charlotte, Charlottenhof palace. Um, and could you talk a bit about this and how this um, beautiful object is sort of transporting us into this beautiful Italian villa estate? So it's always... It's always fascinating, you know, with the with the enthusiasm that early 19th century Prussians had for neoclassicism and and building Athens on the River Spree and Greece and Rome and you know Schinkel was sent to Greece and you know sketched at the foot of the great monuments and you know rebuilding them in Germany and then obviously you know the Mediterranean countries and northern Germany have very different climates and. So, you know, you see these things where you have roof lines and you have um, things that are, look like they should be built for olive groves. And, and this, is, this is northern Germany at the end of the day. And, and so there is a bit of an inconsistency there. It is extremely beautiful. A lot of the, whether you're in Potsdam, sort of, which was the country seat of the Prussian royal family, um, which is today the capital city of the state of Brandenburg, um, or you're in Berlin, um, you see a mixture of styles from different eras, um, from different eras of Prussian royal building. And it's always fascinating 
I find the diaspora and everything you're talking about when it comes to the fluidity of design reaching mm-hmm. out to other places as well and transferring the sense of place of pressure mm-hmm. into um into various other objects we, you mentioned at one point the design of the famous 1929 Barcelona chair yes. um and that's an updated version I believe of Schinkel's garden chair yeah, so the designer of the Barcelona chair, Mies van der Rohe, he was he was born in Prussia as well, um, and he very he's been very he was very clear about this um, in many interviews. He grew up in Schinkel's I mean grew up artistically uh, in Schinkel's Prussia, and he considered Schinkel to be the greatest architect. So he's absolutely considered you know he he's one of the master modernists and. Um, I've often heard Prussian design, um, particularly this chair, described as proto-modern. And I don't know if that's so much correct as it is that the German modernists and the founders of the Bauhaus, we all you know we're all so fond of, if it was just that they grew up among 19th century Prussian objects. Thank you for listening to the Furniture History Society podcast. Join us in our next episode where we speak to Eloise Donnelly all about the peacock sconce designed and made by Alexander Fisher in 1899 as part of the arts and crafts movement.